On today's video, we're looking to improve print quality and lessen 3D printer vibration through a process known as input shaping. We'll look at what features input shaping can improve, how the input shaping system works. We'll test our printer using an accelerometer. We'll interpret those results and then eventually we'll apply them to our 3D printer to ultimately get better prints. And the best part of today's video is we'll be using a USB-based accelerometer for our testing. That means there'll be no soldering involved. This is about as plug and play as it gets. And here we go. Folks, welcome to the channel. I am Leo of Prince Leo 3D. Thank you so much for joining us. And today we're talking input shaping, which like I said, is trying to control vibrations from our 3D printer. So first off, where are these vibrations coming from? Well, inherently, the movement system of our 3D printer is causing vibrations. What it is sitting on while it prints, the tightness or looseness of the belts. Do you have a large spool holder on the top of your frame that is causing some vibrations? Are there any fasteners, screws, or power supplies that are loose and wiggling around while we're printing? The structural integrity of the frame itself. Was it square when you initially assembled it? There are a ton of different factors that are contributing vibrations while we are printing. However, we don't often notice them because we're not printing at super high speeds or most notably super high accelerations. As we explore different firmwares like Clipper, those higher accelerations are offered to us. And when we are printing at higher accelerations, those inherent vibrations can become excited and then it shows up as artifacts on our 3D prints. Most notably, we call these artifacts ghosting or ringing. And that's when images on the outside walls of our model are repeated or echoed. Now, structurally, it's really not a big deal, but if you're printing nice models, quality models, you really don't want to see that kind of thing. We want to print fast, but we don't want to print messy. How do we counteract these vibrations? Through a process known as input shaping. What I have here in my hands, is this an input shaper? No, it is not. This is an accelerometer, and this is what we're highlighting today. This collects data about the vibrations of our 3D printer and that input shapers use that data to counteract our vibrations. An input shaper is an algorithm. It's an open loop control system that's looking to lessen vibrations in our 3D printer. Open loop means that we give it information once and then it keeps going. It's not taking feedback from a system and then reapplying it, which means we test outside of printing, we interpret that data and then we apply it while we're 3D printing. We will never be running input shaping while we are 3D printing. Accelerometer alone will not test our input shaping system. It also needs to have a microcontroller attached to it. That's why this accelerometer is so awesome. This comes with the accelerometer, the MCU in one, a USB cable and a flash device. Everything you need to run input shaping on multiple 3D printers. This is portable. I can use this on my Ender 3 Pro, my CR10, my Voxlib Aquila. I can move it around. This is such an easy method to test for input shaping at such a low cost. This is what I think is the best option out there, but it's not alone. This is a KUSB accelerometer, and this is a community-based design. Both of these devices are accelerometer and MCUs all in one, and they are USB-based which means they can be plugged into any Clipper host device that has a USB port, which nowadays is most of them. Now, today's video, I'm gonna be showcasing the Triangle Labs one, and the article on my website will be the setup of the KUSB-A. The first thing we do is gather data, and that's done outside of printing. We attach our accelerometer to the X axis and then separately to the Y axis. A test begins, and vibration data gets collected. Clipper takes that data and applies five different input shaping algorithms to them. It's at that point we can choose to use what Clipper can recommend us, or we can go and we can look at the graph ourselves and determine what input shaper we wanna utilize. Using the data from that graph and what we wanna use, we go to our printer.cfg, we implement that information, and our 3D printer uses it. So on any subsequent models, we are implementing the input shaper numbers that we tested for. Clipper offers us five different input shapers. The first two are ZV and MZV, and the ZV stands for zero vibration, 
which means they're looking to bring the vibrations to zero. These two input shapers are best used on data that shows a single spike because these input shapers are great at canceling out a very small range of frequencies. And of the two input shapers, the MZV input shaper is usually the most common. The other three that are offered to us are extra insensitive input shapers known as EI. We have EI, two hump EI, and three hump EI. And these input shapers do a good job of canceling out spikes in vibration over a large frequency. And of these three extra insensitive input shapers, the plain old EI is usually what's recommended because as we add more humps to the equation, more smoothing gets produced, which means the corners of our model will get rounded off, which in general is not ideal. Well, it used to only be tied to the Clipper firmware. However, as of December 2022, Marlin has implemented input shaping, although not to the degree Clipper has. Right now, Marlin only offers manual input shaping, which is where you'll print a calibration model, then use some calipers to determine your results. It works perfectly fine. You're gonna get great results. However, the automatic version, which is what we're doing here today, it's probably a little more accurate. It's definitely quicker and probably easier overall as an experience. But if you're using Marlin firmware still, we'll jump over to Clipper, but if you don't, I have no doubt at some point Marlin will be offering automatic firmware. So a lot of this information should eventually apply to you. Now, what 3D printers can we use input shaping on? Can we only use them on Ender 3 Pro styles, bed slinger style printers? No, we can use this on any 3D printer. On the bed slinger style 3D printers, first we'll test the X axis. We'll remove the accelerometer. We'll place it on the Y axis and we'll test there. On Core XY style printers like an Ender 5, you won't have to remove the accelerometer because the print head is the X and the Y directions. So those tests can be run back to back without any movement. Okay, so I've literally just talked about input shaping for an hour and 15 minutes. I really hope I edited most of that out. It's time to start implementing it. I want better prints. So let's start by configuring our host device for our automatic input shaping. And we begin by SSHing into that device. Before we get into the configuration, I wanna go over the parts that came in the box with my Triangle Labs accelerometer. First, we have this flash device and four DuPont wires. And that is used to flash clipper onto our accelerometer. In the middle, we have the accelerometer itself, the ADXL. And this is what we'll use to test for the vibrations on our 3D printer. And it comes pre-equipped with blue tack at the back of it. Lastly, we have the USB-A to USB-C cord. The USB-C end plugs into our accelerometer and the USB-A should plug into whatever your host device is. Now, this is about a six foot long cable. So when you are testing, be conscious of that and make sure that it is secure and tucked away so it's not getting pulled around while testing. Our setup begins by SSHing into our Clipper host device, which for this video is the Innovato Quadra. I type in the IP address, and once I have access to the terminal line, we're going to execute two commands that will download and install all the necessary packages to perform our input shaping routine. Start by pasting in this first command and hitting enter. It will begin by downloading all the necessary files. All of these commands can be found in either the description or on my website itself, and all these commands can be copied and pasted directly to your terminal line. Back at the terminal line, we are going to enter and run the second of our two commands, and that should finish up the configuration of our host device. Now that our host device is configured for input shaping, we need to set up our accelerometer, and that requires us to flash Clipper firmware onto it. And to do that, we are going to continue to use the terminal line of our host device to set up and create the firmware image. To start, we need to change the directory to our Clipper folder. Then we open our firmware image creator using the line make space menu config. And this should look familiar to you as we used it when we initially flashed Clipper onto the main board of our 3D printer. We now set up the firmware image specific to the chip that is in your accelerometer. My accelerometer shipped with an STM32 variant, and this is the proper configuration for that chip. However, you need to double check what chip your accelerometer has. As we move towards the future, it's possible Triangle Labs could replace the chip that they're shipping with this accelerometer. Double check your chip and make sure you're setting up the firmware image correct. If you have the STM32F variant, then this is the correct image. If not, 
check all the documentation that came with your accelerometer. Once I have set up the firmware image correctly, I hit Q on my keyboard that will prompt me to save the configuration, and then I hit Y to save. We're brought back to the terminal line, and we write in the word make and hit enter. That will begin the process of compiling the firmware image you just set up. It will turn it into a .bin file, and we'll use that to flash Clipper onto our accelerometer. One last step before we flash our accelerometer is to run the following line. This will give us the current addresses of processes running on our host device. After we plug in our accelerometer, we're going to run this line again. A new address will populate, and we'll know that is associated with our accelerometer, and we use that address to flash it. Now comes the hands-on part of flashing our accelerometer. We need to hook up the ADXL to the flash device using the four supplied DuPont wires. The four wires should already be plugged into the flash device in the ground, RX, TX, and 3.3 volt pins. Take special care to never plug in the 5 volt pin. On the ADXL itself, it has four similar pins, 3.3 volt, RX, TX, and ground. And all we need to do is connect the wires from the flash device to the ADXL. The 3.3 volt and the ground pins connect to the similar pins on the ADXL, while the RX and TX switch. RX goes to TX and TX goes to RX. After the connections are all set up properly, we're going to insert the flash device into an open USB port on your host device. Once it is plugged in, two lights on the ADXL should be illuminated. Now we're going to enter the accelerometer into a flash state, and we need to press two buttons on the accelerometer itself. Find the button labeled boot, press it, and hold it. While you're holding that button, depress the button labeled reset above it for about one second, and then release. After that, you can release the boot button. Now only a single light should be illuminated on your ADXL. The PC13 light should have turned off. Your accelerometer is in a flash state, and then we move back to our computer. With our accelerometer plugged in, we repeat the last line we ran, and you'll see a new address has populated. And for me, it ended in USB 1. We can now paste in the following command and amend the last section to whatever address populated for you. And again, I'll amend this to USB 1 because that's the address of my accelerometer. Hit enter and the flash will begin. The terminal line will tell you when this process has finished and you can now disconnect your accelerometer. We now unplug the flash device from our clipper host, and then we unplug the ADXL from the flash device. Now take the supplied USB cord, plug one end into your accelerometer, and the other end into your host device. And when you do, both of the LEDs on your accelerometer should illuminate. We are now going to be creating the configuration file that your front end will be using to control the accelerometer. Leave the SSH window open, we're going to be using it, and now open up a web page and navigate to your front end, and I'm using Fluid. From the home page, navigate to the configurations tab. Once there, click the plus sign and select add file. This is going to be our input shaping configuration file. You can name this whatever you want as long as there's no spaces in it and it needs to end in .cfg. Once you've created the file, click on it to open it. It should be a blank text file and we're gonna paste in the configuration information. Now be careful when you paste this in. When I initially did it, formatting was incorrect. Everything that was supposed to be after the semicolons moved one line down. I didn't catch it right away, and I had to correct it at the end. All this information can remain as is except for the serial address. For that, we need to go back to our SSH terminal. Within the terminal, we're going to run the following line. This will give us the addresses of all the USB devices currently connected. I have two outputs. One is my printer. The other is the accelerometer. Copy the address for the accelerometer. Return to the configuration file. Delete what is currently after serial and paste in the correct address. It's at this point where I realized that the formatting was not correct, so I went back and made all the proper corrections. And this is how your configuration file should look. And to take a quick look at what is in this configuration file, the top section is the serial address of the MCU. The section labeled ADXL345 has information on the actual accelerometer, and you can keep all that information as is. And below that, the resonance tester section has information about the testing process. Leave the Excel chip information, and below that probe points is the location in the X, Y, and Z planes where the printhead will be. Once you've entered the serial address and the formatting is correct, use the save button in the upper right hand corner to save all your changes. We've created our accelerometer configuration file but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be used. The only information Clipper identifies 
is what is contained within your printer.cfg. So we need to enter the printer.cfg and make a reference to the file we just created. Click on your printer.cfg file to open it up and then find some open space. I like to keep this right near the top and we're gonna add a reference to that file. This line is gonna be within square brackets and we start with the word include and then a space, then enter the file name you created, including the extension .cfg. And this needs to be spelled exactly like the file was that you created, and it is case sensitive. What we did here was use the include command to pull in our newly created accelerometer file to our printer.cfg file. The reason we did it like this, instead of adding the information directly to our printer.cfg file, is just because it's a cleaner way. Now we click the save and restart button to save our settings and restart the firmware. And when everything boots up, it should be error free. And we can now begin our testing. Now let's talk mounting. This topic alone could fill a 30 minute video. So I'm going to try and give you an abridged version. There's really two concepts to mounting, rigid or passive. Rigid mounting is when we stabilize the accelerometer down to something rigidly on our 3D printer. We can print a mount, screw the accelerometer to that mount, and then the mount gets attached somewhere to our printhead or our bed. The accelerometer is rigid. It is stable in place. Passive mounting is when we use something like double-sided tape or blue tack to stick the accelerometer to the printhead or the bed. It is way quicker, but it feels a little less stable. Most people recommend rigid mounting, but in my opinion, I like passive mounting. I've gotten the same or similar results both ways. So if you can't rigidly mount your accelerometer, by no means is that going to dismiss our input shaping results. Well, if we're talking about the X axis, which is the printhead, my preference is to keep it off the fan shroud. During our testing, I keep all my fans off except the hot end fan, which won't turn off. If our accelerometer is on that shroud, it's gonna get some extra unwanted vibrations and our results could be a little skewed. If possible, I prefer to keep it on this carriage plate. It's usually a rigid only option, but you'll see in this video, I kind of meet both options halfway. As for the bed, I generally keep it to the edges of the bed while I test it. If you have a rigid mounting system, you will likely be keeping it towards the edge of the bed because the mount is going to go there. Anywhere on the bed surface is likely fine. The middle is even fine because that's where most of your models will be put down on just so long as wherever you put your accelerometer, it's stable to its mount or its bed and the wire coming off has been stabilized. While I run my test, should my spool be on? Should my fans be on? To be honest, it's really up to you. It's so hard to get an optimal scenario because while we print, the scenario is changing all the time. Your spool is moving, it's lessening weight of filament. More weight is getting deposited on your bed and if it's a bed slinger like this, that means the resonance frequencies or the dampening is going to be changing. So getting that 100% true to printing scenario is really hard. What I like to do, I turn off all my fans except for the hot end fan. I keep my filament as is. I keep filament in my nozzle and I run my tests. Now it's time to mount our first axes and I chose the X. And for this mounting, I'm using passive. I'm using the blue tack that came with the Triangle Labs accelerometer and I'm going to place it onto the fan shroud. This is the easiest and most common way to mount it. And you'll see in this video, one of the reasons I don't prefer this location. One final thing about mounting, our accelerometer has axes and they do not need to be lined up to the axes of our printer. After our tests, a single axis is going to show vibration results. And we know that is the axis that we were testing. Our accelerometer is plugged in, clipper is running without errors, and our accelerometer is mounted to our 3D printer. It's time to start testing. And this test takes place on the home page of our front end and specifically in the console terminal where we will send commands. The first of these commands is to check to make sure the accelerometer is plugged in and powered correctly. Input the accelerometer query command into your console, hit enter, and you should get a response. If an error comes up at this time, check the connection to your accelerometer and make sure it's plugged in correctly. The correct response to this is a number output. The numbers are completely inconsequential, but the fact they've given them to me shows that my accelerometer is working. Now, the next line we're gonna run is to measure the noise that is currently on our accelerometer. Any ambient vibrations that our accelerometer is picking up should be kept to a minimum to try and get the cleanest possible data. 
optimally. We would like all the numbers to be at or below 100. You can see that is not the case for me. That is likely because the accelerometer is currently mounted on a fan shroud and the fan is running. Now, of course, that will be happening while we are printing, but we want to get the cleanest possible results from our accelerometer. So I'm going to move it around and see if I can lower the noise. I want to take this accelerometer off the fan shroud and place it right here onto the carriage. This is what the hot end is directly mounted to, and it should give us slightly more accurate results. The board on this accelerometer is fragile, so be careful when dismounting it. And this time I opted to use double-sided tape, as the blue tack can lose some adhesion over time. And here's that 3D printed mount I created, and all we're going to do is stick the accelerometer with the new double-sided tape onto the ledge of that mount. There's a lip in the back of that ledge, which should create a tight fit on the print head carriage. I slide it on, lock it in place, and we should be ready to retest. After remounting it, I run the measure axis noise again, and now you can see the noise is much, much lower. It's not at or below 100 on all axes, but it's close enough, and I feel confident we're going to get accurate results. Before we start our test, we need to home the machine if you haven't done so already. And after homing, you may want to run that measure axis noise command again because the accelerometer may have shifted. And it's at this point where our paths can diverge. I'm going to show this video using the test resonance line for each axis. That runs the standard input shaping test. We will then run an additional command to plot the data on a graph, and then we can analyze the results from the test. After we get those results, we're going to input them into our printer.cfg under a new section we create called input shaper. That sounds like a lot, and to be honest, it is. If you don't want to spend that much time on this, or if you want to come back to it later, but still get the benefit of input shaper right now, you can run these lines, shaper calibrate for each axis. That runs the same test, it gets the same results, but instead of you interpreting the information, Flipper does it, and it recommends the best input shapers based on that data. And when it's finished, it applies the recommended input shapers and their settings to your printer.cfg. It's all automated. But in this video, we're going to be using test resonances. And let's start now. Back on the console, we enter the line test resonances and the axis we are testing. And for me, I started on the X axis, hit enter, and the test begins. Now, the first time you run these tests on both axes, you want to stand by and watch. The vibrations can become violent on your 3D printer, and you should be ready to hit the emergency stop button or unplug your printer if it gets too out of control. This test will send frequencies from 5 hertz to 133 hertz through the X axis, and you can hear the vibrations waxing and waning as it happens. When the test is finished, the console line tells us the data has been written to a file on our Clipper host device, and we'll access that file later to turn the results into a graph. Now it's time to test our Y axis, and on our 3D printer, we first need to move the accelerometer into place. I remove the accelerometer and 3D printed ledge from the X carriage, and then I take extra care while removing the accelerometer from that 3D printed ledge. And now with just the accelerometer and the double-sided tape, I stick it to the front left corner of my bed. And don't forget to tuck that wire up onto the extrusion. And we're now ready to test the Y axis. Once the accelerometer has been mounted to the Y axis, we want to again run that measure axis noise command to see how much noise is on our accelerometer. After the noise check, it's on to testing. Again, enter the test resonance line, enter Y as your axis, hit enter, and the test begins. Again, if this is your first time testing the Y axis, stand by and make sure the vibrations are not too much for your 3D printer. The test finishes, and again the console tells us the data has been written to the Clipper host device. So that's where we need to go. If you close down your SSH terminal, you're going to want to reopen it and SSH back into your Clipper host device. And we're going to run two lines, but we're going to run them as just a single block of commands and execute them together. 
these lines take the data that has been plotted and turns it into a .png file, which allows us to see the actual results of the test. Once that's finished, we can close this SSH terminal down and we're going to open up a different one. This time we're going to use WinSCP to SSH into the host device. We've used WinSCP in the past, and its biggest feature is its overlay. When we open up this terminal, the left side of the screen is all files and folders local to the computer that I'm on, and the right side is all files and folders local to my Clipper host device. Now, Clipper has told us through the console a few times where it has written these files, and that's the TMP folder. To access that, we need to go to the root directory. We do that by clicking the drop down at the top of this menu and selecting the root folder. From there, we find the TMP folder and enter it. And in here, you'll see there are two .png files that have been created. We can't just open a .png file directly from our Clipper host device. We need to first move it onto our computer to do that. To make everything a little easier, I'm going to create a folder called Leonardo on my PC. And I'm doing that all through WinSCP. And I'm going to copy those .png files right into there. Once the files have been moved, we can close down the WinSCP terminal. Navigate to that folder or directory where you copied those .png files. And then we can open them and begin to analyze the data. We've finished our input shaping tests, and now it's time to analyze the data they produced. To do that, we use the graphs that we created. And I'm going to start with the y-axis graph. When you first open it up, there's a lot going on, and it can look very confusing. But don't worry, we're going to start by breaking down all the elements. At the bottom is the frequency. These are the different hertz that we performed our test at, starting at 5 and ending at 133. Above that is the accelerometer's response to those particular frequencies. There are five different lines that denote different axes, but we're only concerned with the axes that spike, and it does not need to correspond to the axes we were testing. The purple line represents all axes and we'll disregard it. The green line here shows a significant spike, so that's very obviously the axes that we were testing. The light blue line shows the plotted axes after the recommended input shaper has been applied to it. We'll get to the input shapers momentarily. The scale on the left is the power spectral density, aka how powerful the spikes in vibration were. Now the most important aspect to us here is this upper portion, the magnitude. Ultimately, the magnitude determines how powerful these vibrations are. 1E3 is the lowest magnitude I've seen, and the highest is 1E5. 1EX represents 10 to the X power. So in our example, 1E4 translates to 10 to the fourth power. A lower magnitude is always preferred, and usually we can use this as a comparison between tests. If we were to tighten belts or lower the noise on our accelerometer prior to a test, we might see an adjustment in that magnitude. Let's turn back to the graph proper and take a look at the final section, the different input shapers. The five different input shapers are all represented by five different dotted lines. The one input shaper that Clipper recommends will be a dotted and dashed line. The key in the upper right hand portion denotes which input shaper is tied to which color dotted line. Let's take a look at the key and break down exactly what it's trying to tell us. Starting from the left, we have the name of each of the input shapers. They start with ZV and they end with 3 hump EI. Below that is the recommended input shaper. That means out of all five of these, Clipper is recommending this particular input shaper, and in our example, it's MZV. So let's look at that one input shaper in particular. The first bit of data next to the input shaper name is the frequency at which it recommends we set that input shaper. This would be the number we enter in our printer.cfg for Clipper to use while it is printing. Next to the frequency is the vibration control this input shaper will have. 
and this is showing that this input shaper will theoretically reduce vibration to zero. Next to that is the smoothing. Now this number should not be used as an absolute value, but more for a comparison basis. We can use the amount of smoothing given for this input shaper and compare it to the four others to determine which input shaper will have more smoothing given these values. Lastly is the acceleration. This is by no means what you should set your maximum acceleration to. That is an entirely different calibration. What this number represents is for this input shaper to remain effective, your max acceleration needs to be under this value. In this example, the MZV input shaper should work as intended so long as your maximum acceleration is set to 4500 or lower. If after calibrating your maximum acceleration, you find your value is higher than what is recommended here, that means that this particular input shaper may not offer you the desired effect. And again, determining your maximum acceleration is an entirely different calibration. Now that we've gone over the different parts of the graph, let's take a look at the graph as a whole and determine which input shaper we think we should use and at what frequency. Looking at this graph, the first thing you will notice is there is a single spike in frequency. There's a little bit of noise down to the right of it, but it's nothing we should be concerned about. As mentioned earlier, a single spike in frequency leads us to one of the zero vibration input shapers, ZV and MZV. Out of the two zero vibration input shapers, I prefer to use the MZV. In a general sense, what we're trying to do is find the input shaper that's at its lowest point when the peak in vibration is at its highest. Because we only have a single spike in vibration, we go to the peak and draw a straight line down to the scale of frequency. Each of the dashes on the frequency scale is 5 hertz. By drawing this line, we can determine it happened between 35 and 40 hertz. And because of its location closer to the 40 side of hertz, I prefer to call this 38 hertz. And that is the frequency I would set my input shaper to. Now, if we go up to the recommended scale, you'll notice Clipper got there as well, but their recommended frequency was 39.0 hertz. Will a delta of one hertz really affect our printing? In my experience, no, not really. Even if I was to set this to something like 41 hertz, I would likely still get the benefit of this input shaper. And that's all we need to do for this Y axis. And now let's move to the graph for the X axis. When I open it up, the first thing I look at is the magnitude, and that's been recorded as 1 E4, which means it's not too high and it's not too low. The next thing I notice, and the most obvious, is that this particular graph has two peaks in vibration, which means we will likely be using an EI style extra insensitive input shaper. And this graph will also help us determine why those zero vibration input shapers aren't at their best when dealing with multiple peaks in vibration. The ZV and MZV input shapers are represented by blue and yellow dotted lines respectively. If you are colorblind, I apologize. I will do my best to point them out. We're looking for input shapers that are at their lowest point when the peaks in vibration are at their highest. The ZV input shaper misses the first peak in vibration completely, and it's at its lowest point, which isn't all that low, at the second peak in vibration. The MZV input shaper is at a low point when our first peak is at a high point, but during the second peak, it's not at the lowest possible point. This might be a decent option for you. You could always try, but it's likely at that second peak where those higher frequencies lie, the MZV input shaper will not be effective. And now let's look at the EI input shapers. Clipper is recommending EI as the input shaper, and that's represented by a green dashed and dotted line. If we follow that line, we'll see that the EI input shaper is at a low point when the first peak is at a high point. And then during the second peak, the EI input shaper is also at a low point and it's trending its way back up. The final two EI input shapers never trend upwards after the second spike, which means they may result in more smoothing. But that's something you could always test out for yourself and find out. I would agree with Clipper. The EI input shaper is what I would be using. Its path on the graph is almost a mirror reflection of our spikes and vibration which is what we want. Now, how do we determine the frequency to use when we have multiple spikes? First, I find the frequency of the first peak in vibration. I drew a straight line down and I found it to be at 73 Hertz. Then I find the peak of the second vibration. Drawing a straight line down, I calculated it to be at 113 Hertz. To determine the range of frequencies those spikes covered, I subtracted the lower Hertz from the greater Hertz and it left me with 40 Hertz. Then I wanted to find the midway point of that range.
because it's that value, the midway point between the two spikes in vibration, where I want to set the frequency for our input shaper. So I divided our number 40 by 2. That gave us 20. I then added 20 to our initial value of 73, and it left me with 93. That is the midpoint between the initial peak in vibration and the final peak in vibration. And that is what I want to set my EI style input shaper to, the midway point between those two peaks in vibration. And now if we look at the value Clipper recommends, it's very similar. They recommend a hertz of 94.8. Is it more accurate than me? Likely, it's probably way smarter than me. Would I go with that? No, I would try my 93.0 hertz and see how well it works. You don't have to hit this frequency directly on the nose. Our input shapers will still work and be effective if you are in close to the optimal numbers. So for me, this EI input shaper will be set to 93.0. And now that we have the frequencies and the input shapers for both our axes, we're going to input that information into our printer.cfg to be used while we print. We now have our correct input shaper data, and now we need to apply those results. And to do that, we add it to our printer.cfg. Open up the home screen of your front end, move to the configuration page, and then click on the printer.cfg to open it. You can add this information anywhere you want within your printer.cfg as long as there's open space. I usually keep this towards the top. I'll make some room and then I'll paste in this empty template. This is an input shaper section. It has the frequencies for both X and Y axes as well as the desired input shaper for both those axes. Now I can input the information for my X axis. The frequency was 93.0 and the input shaper I'm using is the EI extra insensitive input shaper. For the y-axis, our value was 38.0, and the input shaper I chose was the MZV. Now that we've used our accelerometer and gotten our input shaper numbers, we can unplug our accelerometer, but we need to make one more amendment in our printer.cfg. We need to go up to that include line that we added before, and we need to comment it out. If this is not commented out, Clipper will be looking for the MCU of our accelerometer. It won't find it, and it will throw an error. So when we're not using it, it gets commented out. And if you want to use it again, you can remove the comment. Now we save and restart our firmware. We should hopefully have no errors. And now we can start a print and see how our input shapers are working for us. And now for our test prints. This is a 200 by 200 by 200 millimeter test cube that I am printing in vase mode on Cura. And this should give us a clear picture as to the ghosting on our embossed images. The cube on the left was first printed without any input shaping, while the cube on the right had our input shaping numbers being applied. This was printed at a relatively high speed, just under 100 millimeters per second, and you can very clearly see the results of these cubes. While the x-axis is pretty clean to begin with, that y-axis has a tremendous amount of ringing, and our input shaper numbers cleaned it up almost completely. It is night and day, and this will apply to all our models going forward. You can see in these prints the result input shaping has. And honestly, this is a long video. You might have to digest it a few times. It's not that hard once you get input shaping hooked up once to retest it or to test it on a different machine is very, very quick. This is one of our great clipper calibrations that we've just done. As far as its place in the hierarchy, this is what you want to do first before pressure advance. So if you've already calibrated and tuned pressure advance, you're going to want to go back and do it again. Input shaping should be determined first, and then you can determine your pressure advance. Please subscribe if you haven't. We have a lot more videos in general, Clipper and otherwise. We have some giveaways coming up. I believe my next video is going to be an unboxing and giveaway of that particular printer. So please stay tuned. It's going to be really simple to get involved in this giveaway. I'm going to let you know that right now. So watch that video to find out exactly how you can be enrolled in that giveaway. We have more Clipper calibrations. A pressure advance video is on the horizon for our Clipper printers. I just received my parts for the Clacky Probe, another Kevin aka Sam modification. It's going to take the place of our BL Touch and it's awesome. And then I have something I can't even talk about yet. I'm so excited. I was given the opportunity to unbox and test a 3D printer that there's not even information out there on right now. I can't wait, but it's all thanks to everyone out there for contributing to this community and I thank you. 
If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. There's gonna be all those videos and more on the horizon. Like I said, some giveaways, enter a comment. It's a conversation. It helps me out, it helps you out. It helps other people out who eventually have the same problem and read your solution. Join the Discord. We're talking every day. 3D printing and other. It's an awesome community. I thank everyone that goes there and shares their thoughts, ideas, and 3D prints. Thank you so much. And now, until next time, boys, girls, everyone else, keep on printing.